All right, hey guys, welcome to the stream. This is gonna be the second episode of Norm Hunter. And uh, I'm here with uh, with Todd. Hey, Todd. What's up, how's it going? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's actually very, I'm, this is like, this has been the stream I'm, I've been looking forward to like every week because it has like this like cool concept and eventually it's gonna go up on YouTube and hopefully be a, be a whole thing. Um, cool. So yeah, today we'll just be checking in with you. Uh, if you didn't see the episode uh, last week, we essentially talked a little bit about Todd's chess, his training plan, and uh, set something out. And uh, here we have the actual spreadsheet that uh, Todd has been using. Um, I don't know if you're a big habits guy. I've always found like spreadsheets and trackers are just like the best way to get something done because they just they're like they keep you in check you just you mark it down a lot of times it's it's satisfying to do so do you do you feel like that does it help you oh a absolutely I, I i think that that some people like gravitate toward tracking things and keeping spreadsheets and others do not and i'm definitely in the former camp and yeah whenever i've needed to build a new habit like especially um uh, uh the two big ones that that come to mind are like exercises or or or, or doing something with with my finances, um, I always find that that tracking things carefully is pretty much the only way that uh, that I can be successful long term. It, it seems to be very very important. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty similar. I I feel like I don't know if it's the same for you. For me, the the hardest part is just like the initial like just the initial bit of work to like set it up. Just like for me, I always have trouble designing like how I want to format it. Like, do I want the date up top or how do I like <laughs> want to track yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. Um, but once you get it set up then it's like the, the best thing in the world. So this was your plan, basically going through these two books, um, solving uh, somewhere around like one page per day of perfect your chess, uh, mm -hmm. which I think they have like six problems per page and going through one game of how Karpov wins. Um, so yeah, it looks like you filled it out for, for the past week and how's it, how's it been going so far? Uh, it's been going well, yeah. Uh, the two main challenges uh, uh, this week were um, uh, number one, getting my sort of uh, analysis and puzzle solving back in shape. In the uh, previous month, um, I didn't do a whole lot of work on chess. I, I was not very consistent. When, whenever that happens, my calculation can get a little rusty. Um, so over the course of uh, the week I noticed that my analysis got a little clearer and you know I was I was blundering or, or missing simple things uh, less often which was good mm -hmm. um, and number two was was finding um, the sort of uh, 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 good times to get these uh, study sessions in so as I as I mentioned a, a little bit in the uh, the past session and one of the main reasons why I reached out to you uh, to get sort of a more concrete plan and a little external accountability for my chess study is that uh, I have uh, uh, three kids and I'm, I'm married and my, my wife and I both work. I, I, I do remote software development and uh, she's an attorney. Um, and with the uh, uh, current quarantine situation, like we have no childcare. And so our, our, our days are very busy in terms of juggling kids and getting our work in at, at strange hours of the day. Uh, so there's, there's less time uh, for chess currently than I would like. So a lot of these study sessions have been uh, late night sessions. That, that, that's usually when I'm able to get the most um, sort of uh, uh, time to work on chess, uh, especially with, with, uh, without crazy kids running around. Um, but so far that's been, that's been going well. And the best times to study for me either seem to be early morning if I can manage to wake up uh, uh, before my before my kids like like an hour before they wake up and get in the study session or late at nights. Cool. And um, so on average, how long will like uh, a problem take you from the perfect your chess book? Yeah. So actually, I just started writing that down, um, and that was uh, a to get some data and also b to prevent like getting distracted in the mi middle of the puzzle and like checking my phone or something stupid like that. Um, it's actually varied quite a lot. Like there are a couple of puzzles um, that are just like shots and once you see the shot like you're certain that it's the answer so like on the low end it can be like one to two minutes for you know a small handful of puzzles you just solve them immediately um there are a couple of puzzles where uh, i'm just struggling and i i think for like 20 minutes and usually cap it around there because i i generally don't feel that looking for longer than 20 minutes is super productive um but an average time is like five to eight minutes 
something like that for a typical puzzle, but it does vary quite a bit from puzzle to puzzle. Gotcha. Um, and how about the Carpa book? How long will it take you to go through a game there? Yeah, those are uh, a little breezier. You know, the, the games are, are annotated fairly lightly. Um, like, there's certainly not a lot of dense variations in the book. Um, he mostly describes things uh, uh, with words um, and gives, like, some light variations. Uh, so a typical Karpov game, maybe, like, 20, 30 minutes. Nice. And how are you finding those, like, pretty interesting? Do you enjoy that part? Yeah, I I like the book. I feel like Karpov has a style uh, that's very uh, different from mine, and so um, I like you know the fact that in 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 a lot of the games, his moves will be difficult uh, for me to guess, or like uh, he'll come up with these simple little positional plans that I probably wouldn't have thought of in a real game, um, and so they're uh, uh, they're quite pleasant. Um, I I don't think that it's testing my analysis a lot because the games are not like. Um, super dense, but maybe I could pick like a couple spots during the game. Like if I tr if I sense that maybe it's a critical moment where I sit and think and then compare what I did to uh, what Karpov did and possibly check with the computer. Yeah, a lot of coaches are into uh, I guess the move as a training exercise. I, I think it is good actually. I think Karpov is one of the better players for it because his games are typically like pretty logical and consistent. Um, but I find that for a lot of other players, their games can be a little bit random like one game they're attacking next game they're just like playing for a small advantage and it's like you don't really know what exactly you're uh, looking for yeah so i think it's a good way to kind of add a little bit of extra um benefits maybe not just to the analytical side but um to your memory actually like if you explore some variation in a game i think you're kind of more likely to remember details about that game later because you built up like this attachment to it, like, oh, you looked at this position for 15 minutes That's or something. True. That's definitely true. Um, or I, I imagine there are moments where the move that Karpov plays is almost like profound. Like you you have this feeling like you would have never even considered this idea, <laughs> regardless yeah. of how much time you had. Um, I remember having that experience quite a bit when I was going through uh, Shirov's book, Fire on Board. He'd make this like crazy like tactical sacrifice He's like already down one pawn, sacrificing a second pawn. I don't understand what the compensation, is, where it's coming from, uh, but then it all works out in the end. Like he, you know, gets the attack, and and then you go back and like, yeah, I think when you have, when you go through those types of games, that's where you really like, I feel like you find that depth and you really like develop your game. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So for uh, the episode today, you have prepared. Um, uh, a game. So you played this game, you annotated it. We haven't looked at it or really discussed it much at all. We're just going to look at it now on stream and kind of just talk about your chess. Yep. And um, so tell us a little bit about this game. Obviously, it was like an online game. Um, who are you playing and yeah. what was the time control? So this was a game that was uh, set up by uh, uh, Alex Lenderman. So he uh, had a student, um, a, a kid student, I think he was like 13 years old, and he was rated 2000 USCF, uh, a kid from New Jersey. Uh, and he set up a game uh, between me and him, and I'm, I'm playing one more of his students uh, this coming Saturday. Um, uh, the time control was uh, 60 plus 20, so basically about as long as you would realistically play online. Um, mm -hmm. But like a nice slow, nice slow time control. Um, all right. So, okay. So you you have annotated the game. We talked a little bit off stream, but basically you, for the most part, analyzed it yourself without the help of the engine. But you did check some moments just to see what the computer uh, was saying at that point, right? Yeah. As I was telling you, it takes like especially after a loss or a difficult game, like. A tremendous amount of self-control not to turn on the engine especially when it's right there in front of you on Lee chess and you can just hit a button and like know everything mm -hmm. uh but i've been i've been trying to resist that urge uh more and more when analyzing my games cool i mean i I'm actually i i definitely go back and forth on this i mean i i 100 percent believe in the value of trying to like break down what happened in the game um, without the help of the engine, as a lot of a lot of coaches talk about, Jesse often often preaches on this channel. Um, on the other hand, I totally get the 
the need to like just you know you want to know like the answer and the engine can just kind of tell you like oh yeah in this position you know you missed this exact and then it just psychologically feels good um yeah so i'm definitely not too strict about like oh you have to analyze it yourself before you you check the engine i just think what usually happens is like if you do run it through the engine then you're less likely to do that kind of harder analytical work uh later on right yeah um, now there is maybe something nice about like, you know, let's say you didn't find the right continuation during, uh, the game and you, you know, you knew you had something at some critical moment or you, you know, you lost the game. So obviously you could have defended better at some point. There is some benefit to trying to like break that down yourself just to see if you can reflect on the game enough to the point of like, you understand what mistakes you made. Um, but you know, if it's like such, it was like a four hour game, like, okay, clearly like you didn't figure it out during the games. So now you have to sit there and suffer and like <laughs> try to figure it out yeah, after the game. That's true. So I always just feel like, you know, like clearly I, I wasn't good enough at this moment. So let's, let's check the solution. And, but then of course the important part is after that to kind of, in my opinion, break it down and like, okay, I missed some kind of defensive idea. Why didn't I see this move? Why didn't I consider this move? That's kind of the, I think, the most valuable question to, to ask and, and answer. Um, a lot of times, you know, you'll find a pattern. Like, many players struggle with defense because they're not able to find, like, tactical defenses. Like, trying to play for counterplay, for example, or, you know, the uh, square is attacked and they only consider moves that just directly defend the square without thinking about maybe an indirect way of defending or some something more more tactical so this is like a pretty common issue that players have and if you like you notice this during the game then okay you can work on it outside of uh outside of training games and, and try to correct it or at least uh focus on it um okay you mentioned so you you lost this game yes awesome well good for you for uh, sharing it and, and analyzing it and <laughs> I'm sure it'll be. Um, I'm sure it'll be helpful. And uh, take us through the opening here. Did you did you prepare this line with um, with Queen D4? Was this a surprise for you? Yeah, I, I didn't prepare for my opponent at all. I, I just went into the game cold. Mm -hmm. um, so Queen takes D4 was was uh, something that I was happy to see because I had actually reviewed these lines um, fairly recently. And at the uh, U.S. Team East tournament, I had I had had this line as black and gotten a really uh, pleasant position. Um, so I felt like I was just going to get a repeat of that game, or you know, something that I something that I knew. Um, so I played my my normal move, which is which is this uh, knight c6 and bishop d7 uh, system. But then on move six, he surprised me with a move that um, I had never seen before, and actually isn't mentioned in the book uh, that I used to learn this line, which is Catronius's uh, book on the anti-Sicilian. Um, he played uh, this queen d3. Mm -hmm. uh, move so basically, uh, uh, almost everyone plays bishop takes c6. Like I've had this position a bunch of times, and I think that I, I've seen bishop takes c6 every single time in uh, this uh -huh. position. But queen d3 uh, is a move. Uh, it's the it's the second move in this position. It's a relatively rare one, but um, it is uh, uh, increasing in popularity. And the and the main thing, uh, the the main point here is that um, against uh, this setup going into the Meraxi binds, I play the recommendation from the book, which is this interesting move F5, oh, uh, nice. which which kind of denies white his uh, uh, his um, desired setup here and, and leads to like d dynamic positions, which are very pleasant um, and where I feel quite comfortable. Um, but this move of queen D3 is like insisting on a Meraxi binds because suddenly C4 is just coming. Um, and you know, there's basically nothing that I can do about it, as far as I can, as far as I can see. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, the Marazzi can be uh, annoying. This structure. I mean, all these, all these sideline ways of getting it, like uh, apart from the accelerated dragon, where like it normally happens. Usually, there's like a reason that it's uh, a less comfortable version. Sometimes it can be a little bit concrete, but usually there is something. Like I. I don't have too much experience here. I've always played um, E6 Sicilians myself. Um, and with white, I, I've never really uh, looked at the queen takes d4 Sicilians. But yeah, I imagine black should have some kind of comfortable way to create some, some counterplay, like with some, some a6, b5 or, or something. Um, did you look at this game in, uh, in chess space? Do you have like a database that you use? Yeah, uh, so I, I have chess base and I, I did look it up a little 
um, and and some of what I found is in is in the notes. Basically, the way that I responded was pretty reasonable, um, but once I knew that uh, a my uh, opponent had surprised me with something I didn't know, and he was banging mm -hmm. out the theory fairly quickly. And uh, once I was getting into uh, this Moroxy bind structure, which I find extremely uncomfortable uh, to play as black, it's probably like one of my most uh, hated structures. Uh, I actually used to play the Accelerated Dragon a long time ago, and I quit <laughs> primarily because of the Moroxy binds. Like, I, 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 I always feel quite uncomfortable here. So basically, as a result of those two factors, I was burning up a lot of time. Um, so I played reasonably in the opening, but I had used like 25 minutes by move, I don't know, like 15, 16, something like that, which was not ideal time management and did impact some decisions later. You know, honestly, I like you weren't familiar with the line during the game. And so normally if a player is not familiar with the line, it's like move six, like you, you'll see grandmasters, I mean, spending tons of time as well because they feel like, okay, if you don't know the position, like too bad, but you have to um, you have to spend some time to try to figure it out and make sure you don't fall into some opening trap. You don't get some like passive position. So I, actually, I don't I don't really blame you for spending the time here because it's kind of like your first uh, first time seeing this line, and yeah, you have to like you have to figure stuff out. So you go with yeah, um, okay. you go with knight f six, and you put knight b four in the notes. Yeah, knight b four I briefly considered, um, and it has been played. Like Nakamura has tried it, some other strong players have tried this night before, but it just looked odd to me. Like it, it, it was hard to assess this concretely, but it just it kind of looked wrong. Um, right. Yeah. Unless this just like wins, then it's like this random like move that yeah. Uh, yeah. I feels mean, strange to play without like without prep. But this is like the other way, I, I guess, to try to um, prevent their their intended setup. Um, so it's worth considering, but yeah, it's a it's a weird looking move, and it just seems likely that that knight's going to get driven away, and knight before will be a loss of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So knight f six, c four, g six, knight c three. Okay, all looks pretty yeah, so normal. Now we have a bunch of normal moves. Castles, castles. Yeah, this was the first little decision. I was deciding whether to play um, a six or rook c eight, which turned out to both be moves in this position. Um, I decided to play a6 first because I felt that if the bishop came to c6 um, with the rook already on the c8 square, sometimes the rook might be in the way. And so I, I figured that a6 was the move that I wanted to play first, and then although rook c8 is probably coming, I can play it second. Yeah, this seems pretty flexible. Um, so it takes, takes, knight d4, knight d7. Yeah, this was where I started um, slowing down a little bit around here. But I, I think that knight d7 is reasonable, like this bishop was blocked, now the bishop's on a nice diagonal, and we have uh, these two possibilities. We don't have to play either of them right away, but they're both there now, so knight d7 seems logical to me. Yeah, I mean, the position definitely looks looks quite reasonable. Um, was there a moment where like you kind of deviated from theory? Like, was rook c8 like, much more popular here or something, or is this still following... A6 is still pretty popular. I think that they were played about equally often, and there were like 30 games um, in each line or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, this this line is fairly topical recently, so there were a bunch of games with like top players in the line. Oh, interesting. Yeah, there, there, there were like Karyakin games and Nakamura. Um, I, I followed some MVL game for, for a while. And how did he do his black here? Uh, MVL won some impressive game, and I, I think that I have that in the note. Yeah, on move 14, I, I, I have the beginning of some MVL game. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah, I don't know how, how Jesse feels about all this. Like, he's the big, you know, game analysis guy. Like, very, very hardcore. You know, you write your notes down, pen and paper. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, you should trust the experts. If MVL has had this position like three times, you know, and he's always played like the same exact plan or something, it means he probably believes in that plan and we should, we should trust him. Um, and if, yeah, if all the top players are like playing in a certain way and, and the, that's been happening recently, like these guys are doing a lot of work and it makes sense to just kind of follow their lead uh, on the opening. So I feel like the information in the database, just like who played what is already like very, very useful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
Okay, so we'll we'll go back. I mean, maybe like it seems like okay. If MVL played a six, then you know, all right. You know, uh, or yeah, yeah. Uh, and MVL played a six, yeah. Then it's like hard to, you know, maybe we'll reach a position that like you really just feel like is not your style. Like maybe concretely it works, but like it doesn't work for you. Then, then we should definitely go back um, before this point and and try to find like uh, some kind of alternative um, that you consider playable. Um, or you simply just have to prepare this line, you know, up to your absolute maximum <laughs> so that whenever you do face it, you're just like ready to just bang out like 18 moves, you know, 95, B5, like you're ready to just play everything out. Yeah. Um, so Rook AC1, Queen Yeah, he five. was also moving, moving quickly here. Yeah, th this is where we deviate from this MDL game. He gotcha. played an interesting I idea. He played this Knight C5, mm -hmm. uh, followed by Bishop T7 preparing f5 next um and he got some like very pleasant dynamic position he he took back with the pawn which is an important idea um which we'll see that that i fail to do later at an important moment in the game but like he has this really pleasant massive pawns uh e5 is coming and he also played a quick b5 at some point in this uh in this position like he played it like one or two moves later and he just got play on both sides of the board and won a nice game very quickly Wow. Uh, who is he playing there? I don't remember. It was a rapid game, but mm -hmm. he was playing somebody else high rated. Gotcha. You know, rapid is interesting. It's like it shows you when these 27, 2800 guys want to play for a win against other GMs, like what kind of positions they're willing to play. Um, and uh, usually if... Um, they might not be willing to play something, you know, in a classical game, but they're willing to play it in a rapid game. Uh, usually these lines are often, like, very useful for players around our level, where, like, we want to just get some play with black. We don't really care about being, like, 100% equal everywhere. And so, yeah, that's kind of the stuff we uh, we look for. Uh, so Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I think that you had mentioned that earlier, and it's something that I'd never quite considered. Um, and in general, I, I feel a little shaky with using uh, chess space and figuring out like which games to look at, uh, and this kind of this kind of thing. So th this is like a useful tip. Oh, cool! Yeah, I. Um, right. I, yeah, I basically feel like so. Right, strong players in rapid. They'll show you kind of like which lines are interesting and, and pose problems. And uh, maybe I mentioned this one before as well, but like twenty six hundred GMs who play in open tournaments. Um, those guys are usually good to follow because they're often playing down a lot of the times in the open tournaments. They want to score wins. They're playing with black against the players like 100 points lower, so they can't just like play whatever. They still have to play something they know well, so they're often like pulling out these tricky lines there. Yeah, those are, those are the games that can be really, uh, really useful. And so the rest of this game, I mean, um, I mean, were you like comfortable? Like if you had this position again and you get to play knight c5 and Bishop d7. Would you be would you be happy here, or would you want to improve on this? Uh, no, I feel like this plan is very logical. Like preserving this bishop while putting it on a square where it can work both sides of the board. Like this makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I would be happy trying this in the future. Although uh, I think that what I played was also also turned out to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so yeah, this I feel like we've accomplished like the first. The first goal I, I find in like game analysis is just figuring out the moment like, okay, where are you going to deviate? If someone just plays these exact same moves against you, like, how are you going to improve on the previous game? This is, I think, maybe the minimum we should try to uh, uncover from like every game analysis. Like, if you're if you want to get better at chess, you don't want to do like the full game analysis. You want to do a little something. At least just look up where you went wrong in the opening or where you could have maybe changed it up or done slightly better or done something like more to your style and. And try to remember for uh, for the next game. I think this is a good a yeah. good approach. Um, actually, a lot of players will do this in in blitz. They'll just like they'll play a bunch of blitz games. Then afterwards, they won't just like they won't analyze the whole game, but they'll just look up like one move. Like oh, in the opening, instead of this, I could have done this, and then try to play for this idea. And slowly, you just build up your your knowledge uh, over time. Yeah, Alex King uh, made a comment mm. to that effect. He said that he tries That's to right. learn one extra move at a time per game, per blitz game. Yeah, um, yeah. shout out to coach uh, Alex King. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's a great way to just get a little bit like of work done without really like all that much effort. In 
even on like you know a lot of these sites like leechesschess.com now you can just almost immediately just look up their uh, their games explorer and just see like okay someone played this move in this position and that can always be uh, super useful okay so here you play um queen h5 oh there is a mofsesian game here like f8 mofsesian is actually a really really strong player he i feel like he often plays these like very tricky openings with black big king's indian guy and a lot of times the engine thinks his positions are just like worse but you know somehow he ends up he ends up winning them Yeah, actually, this is a pretty typical plan. You might remember this from like the accelerated dragon, like bishop e5 and e6. I feel like that's pretty um, thematic. I'm actually not familiar with that plan, but yeah, uh, after he got both of those moves in, it seems like he had a very strong initiative suddenly. Right. Yeah. I mean, basic point is you can imagine like just covering the d6 pawn because normally black. Uh, doesn't want to play e6 in this position and weaken the pawn but if the bishop is secure here then basically it's hard for white to do anything and yeah then black tries to just create counterplay often like f5 happens and both bishops are just like opened up against the the king side um but okay queen h5 seems uh yeah reasonable. i felt like queen h5 can't be wrong necessarily like the the queen is going there probably in most lines and White's king side is a little uh, soft since he's moved some of his pieces toward the center, so it makes sense to sort of just eye the queen in that direction. Yeah, definitely. So b3, uh, knight c5, queen c2, knight e6. Okay, allowing uh, yeah, big change, but I guess you weren't worried about, about this one. Yeah, I thought that... Um, the F file would be useful and that the pawn controlling this square is just good. And also, I, I just think that it's very difficult for a white piece to attack this pawn anytime in the near future. So I thought this would be a favorable change of structure for me. Like, maybe I can do this. Yeah, um, interesting. And if I'm bishop... threatening bishop takes c3 right away, actually. Right. Let's say bishop d4 here. Bishop d4. It's a couple of choices, actually, but I might play, play this move. Mm -hmm. Let's say rook b1. Let's see, e5 can be considered, but maybe just build up more slowly. Yeah, it looks nice for for black. I don't know what white is um, what white is doing here. Probably you could play e5 and just kind of play um, play around this knight that's coming to d5, or even just get ready to to take it with like rook f7 or something. Um, yeah, yeah. I was thinking actually, you could even trade these guys like. Like bishop e5 here or something like okay let white take you'll take with your your queen and then again yeah just this plan or maybe rook f4 and yeah definitely. yeah th th this this looks not as nice as well if the queen comes to e5 it's well placed there and this pawn is weak yeah it feels comfortable for black okay yeah i, I definitely uh get this idea so he goes a4 and uh, okay, you mark this as uh, dubious. Yeah, a four. Um, I think is just drifting a little bit. I, I just don't think that that a four is um, is currently necessary, and it allows this idea that I play next of knight takes d four followed by bishop h six, which I think is um, is a bit annoying. Uh, maybe the idea of a four was to get in like b4 b5 eventually and just kind of slowly steamroll me off the board but i don't think it's happening so quickly because these uh, pawns on c4 a4 e4 will be weak yeah interesting actually i don't know um to me a4 i i definitely don't know if it's the best move or not to me it feels like white should be playing like knight d2 or something but um just like Trying to keep space and maybe preparing like knight f4, knight g3, just to mess with black screen. Yeah, this uh, is the other reason that I didn't like a4 because my idea of knight e6 was to trade, you know, those those knights relieve his um, uh, space advantage a little bit by by making a trade and then activate some other piece. And so this kind of allows me to do that. And yeah, yeah, knight knight d to e2 
has the annoying ideas in the future of knight g3 or knight f4, and it seems better to me. Right, yeah, it just keeps you tangled up. To me, it feels like a4 actually is just trying to stop b5, which I was thinking would be, like, a reasonable idea for black. I'm not, not sure what your opponent was thinking, but it feels like maybe a move he was trying to... Uh, trying to prevent because you're also you can you can play knight d4 or bishop d4 and and b5 basically and i don't know maybe he thought that was annoying I'm not really the other sure thing that that comes to mind is a lot of times in somewhat similar king's indian structures mm -hmm. um sometimes in the english this move a4 is a mistake uh because it leaves although it stops b5 it leaves a weakness on b4 um, and so you can often respond to it with a quick um, a5 or or something like that. So, so sometimes this um, uh, this cure is a little worse than the original problem. Right. Yeah. No. It definitely can be a problem with like b4, b3 squares. Okay. So you you take here, take bishop h6, uh, rook b1, f5. I mean, it feels feels okay. I often just like to kind of see what happened first, and then maybe. Uh, work my way back. So I'm like, okay, well, it looks good. Did it work out? No. Okay, let's go back and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like try this, to see what this, happened. This now quickly goes very goes very wrong. Although I think the black is is now uh, a little better. Yeah, it looks it looks very nice. Um, so it takes takes. Okay, so I see the question mark here. Yeah, this move is terrible. Yeah, I remember in the MVL game you were showing me he he took GF. Um, yeah. Obviously, you didn't know this uh, during the game. Um, but, but perhaps, well, is G4 a problem or is that not, not the issue? No, G4, you're, you're just mating him. Yeah. Um, is, was the issue his next move, knight E2? Yeah, knight E2 is just strong. Mm -hmm. Um, and the rook is just misplaced here. Like, I put it on, uh, F5 because number one, I saw that I could get away with it because G4 doesn't work. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about doubling the rooks, but I, I, I don't really ever want this rook on f5. If I want to double the rooks, I can do it on f7 and f8. And so the rook is just a target here, and it's getting in the way of my of my queen. Yeah, actually, that does feel a little bit awkward. And if these pieces don't coordinate soon, then, yeah, they just kind of get in each other's way. Um, have you ever heard of the rule, like, you know, always play g takes f5 in the King's Indian? Yes, yeah, I have heard that rule. I wonder if it kind of applies here. I mean, it's definitely a very different, more open structure. Um, yeah, and that's why I was hesitant to play g takes f5. But, you know, it, it it does have similar points, like the pawn on f5 locks down the e4 square, and I'm going to have this really nice mobile center pawn mass. Right, yeah, because you're pushing, you're pushing e5, and then maybe king h8, rook g8, to rook f6, rook g6. Um... I mean, the structure yeah. is loose. I mean, you're definitely taking some risk here, but well, if, if you're looking for a dynamic game, then yeah, you have to be ready to, to go here. Uh, so let's let's think about this one. Like, how would white how would white play here? Let's say let's say they try the same ninety two. I often just like to try the same moves. <clears throat> Okay, so now I can start with, I think, e5. Right. Um, let's go... Let's go here. Bishop c3, okay. I think there's more than one move that might be playable, but okay, something like this. Oh, wait, cover are we... This with, cover this with time. Are we blundering... Um... Bishop e4. I mean, this also looks strong. Uh, but maybe this is just... Just a big problem. Oh, yeah, bishop e4. Yeah, this, this looks... Simple and good. Yeah, actually, queen doesn't have any way of staying, like, active. You know, if I could give the exchange and take this one, then... Okay, we can talk about compensation, but yeah, it looks like... Okay, so this is just not... So 92 k is just not really an option then, because then this was possible the whole time. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. I mean, of course, the engine, you know, it always sees the tactical details. It's hard to 
feel this, you know, during the game strategically. Uh, the computer just sees like, oh yeah, there's no 92, there's E5 coming, <laughs> like just calculating all, all these rook lifts already. Um, okay, so then maybe white tries... Let's say queen e2. Yeah, queen e2 is one reasonable idea. Get the queens off, look at this square. Okay, I want to keep the queens on, so let's do this with tempo. And it's a little awkward to defend g2 here, actually, I think. Yeah, we, we don't want to... We don't want to play f3. So let, let's try knight d5. So I'm preparing e5 now. Oh, I thought you were threatening e6. Yeah, maybe that as well. Yeah, yeah, e, e, e6 is... Well, e6, I guess you have... Hmm, 93, not really. Yeah, e6 is a more immediate threat. Yeah, this one feels, um, feels awkward for white. Well, okay, let's say... Let's say we try rook e1. Okay, so now, now let's play here. Okay, bishop e3, just f4, right? And just pushing, so uh, we'll go we'll go back. Maybe keep improving my pieces with... Um... Rook here? Mm-hmm. Although I think that taking on d5 was also a, was also an option there. Maybe this is actually a little better because now you're never going to have these checks, and perhaps now I can play rook g7. Yeah, at this point you can definitely go for this. Like the structure is so nice here. Um, maybe start with this one. You also have like rook c7 because white can't contest the c file here. Which is actually like yeah, yeah, that's true. That's very annoying. Yeah. But I like starting with this one, maybe inducing g3. I don't know if this is forced, and then going here. And then like Yeah, this feels tough for white. I mean maybe queen f3 uh, is kind of more solid here, but Yeah, it feels very comfortable for black, like you're not in a particular hurry to, to attack. Um I actually feel like, you know, the end game would be feels comfortable for you as well just with the with the two bishops and kind of dynamic structure. Um Yeah. Uh D six is a little uh more of a weakness here potentially, but it should be straightforward to keep it under control. Right, everything else I, I kinda get the feeling like should compensate. I mean even if we so we don't even have to play e5 so quickly, you know, we can start with like king f7, just for example, like, okay, putting this one here. Yeah, um, yeah. So, nice. long story short, okay, you go rook takes f5, knight e2. Yeah, but now I make a much worse mistake. <laughs> with rook g5, I see. Yeah. And so basically what happened here is I had like, I don't know, 27 minutes or something, and I spent 20 of those minutes calculating this move, bishop takes g2, mm -hmm. um, which I felt intuitively like it should work that that intuition might not be uh correct here but i just couldn't make it work um and i kept like trying and trying like sort of beyond the point where um i should have just concluded that the sacrifice was no good i just kept coming back to it especially um like this line trying to see if i could uh uh create some tactics here mm -hmm. but um yeah, once I finally rejected the sacrifice, I made kind of like a frustrated decision. Like a lot of times this this is a psychological thing that happens to me where I try to make something work and I try and try and try and I, I just have to throw it out. And so at the end, you know, after spending 20 minutes on this busted idea, I'll spend like 45 seconds coming up with a new idea and then just play it right away. And so yeah. th that, that sort of happened here with rook g5, which is kind of trying to insist on a kingside attack that is not there. Um, and instead, I should have just admitted that my rook on f5 was misplaced and retreated with rook f7. After rook g5, which I played in the game, like, 
my pieces are just in a, a bad cluster on the king side. Yeah, I guess if it doesn't go anywhere, then right they're they're just going to be super misplaced. Um, that's a I mean it's a very common uh, thing that happens to players. I mean it's happened to me many times. Like yeah, you just you know it's a critical position. You know you have to spend time. You spend twenty minutes calculating maybe not just one line but multiple lines that nothing works, and then eventually you just you just play a move that you you know you haven't figured out why you don't like it yet so you just play it <laughs> and yeah yeah and that's and then often those moves end up being even worse than everything else just because like sometimes they're just straight up blunders like there is just some tactic that you didn't check for and and you just get caught um other times they just make your position worse whereas everything else was like maybe not perfect but it wasn't that bad i, I don't know exactly what the fix is for this i mean just experience will kind of teach you like when you're going down this path and, and not to do this. How much time did your opponent have at this point, by the way? He had been moving fairly quickly. I think he had like 40 minutes or something because he had played the opening quite quickly. He he knew it for a while, like, you know, 15 or 16 moves, something like that. And he had a decent amount of time now. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that kind of should play in as well. Like, the more you have to recognize, like, the more time you spend calculating bishop g2, the more you're kind of invested in playing it. And then if you don't play it, then the more time ends up being uh, essentially wasted for uh, everything else. Because, yeah, I mean, it does feel like... I mean, I don't know, we'll look at bishop g2. Maybe there was a way to make it work. But, um, if uh, yeah, if you just go back, like, rook f7 looks, yeah, very natural. If you think about, like, blitz moves, then um, yeah, game yeah. continues, yeah, 100%. And um, I I don't even feel like you're really really worse here. Do you do you feel like you're, you're worse here as black? No, I think it's equal. Um, Rook f7 is a little psychologically difficult to play because it's kind of admitting that I made a mistake, right? Um, like, I, I chose to take on f5 with the Rook instead of the g-pawn, and then I'm immediately retreating the Rook once, you know, he plays this this simple move, knight e2. Um, so I think that that was the bigger factor that that made me resist this this move rather than uh thinking the position was inherently bad after rook f7 right you just didn't want to um to go back yeah didn't didn't want to admit a mistake essentially right right, right. um you know you'll you'll get the hang of it it's actually as soon as you realize like um that like you know admitting the mistake you know kind of gives you better chances for the rest of the game because objectively you know one position will be better than the other then you know you just kind of like you lose that shame. You're like, you know, I don't care. I <laughs> yeah. So to uh, so yeah. So like Bishop G two. So it was this one of the moments you checked with the engine? Did you confirm like it wasn't working? Uh, I did not. But I'm pretty sure based on what I've looked at that it just is nothing. Oh, I see. Yeah, I guess this knight G three definitely feels like it kills a lot of the uh, the ideas here. Yeah, the 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 problem is that like my pieces aren't really coming quickly into the game. Like this is why intuitively maybe I should not have felt so drawn to this sacrifice because after he plays king g1, like if I put my rook on g5, it's blocking this bishop, so this bishop's not participating. And meanwhile, like knight g3 and rook d3 and queen d3 are all defensive resources for him. Right, yeah. Seems like he's he's kicking you out. Um, yeah, if I could arrange some like rook h5 takes h3, this would be strong, but it's always too slow because he just plays queen d3 or rook d3. Right. Yeah, I'm not not really seeing. Uh... Yeah, not really seeing such a great try for you here. Um, okay, so. So rook g5, he was knight g3, queen h4. Yeah, one interesting tactic here was that if he had played knight f4, I, I, I don't think this is a very natural move at all, but if he plays this, I, I have this uh, neat mm. tactic. Nice, wow. Uh, so hold but, on a sec. So he's not 100% getting mated. He can go king f1, but then it's just, just bad, huh? Yeah, I, I think that he's actually still getting uh, uh, bishop mated three. After, nice. after this move. Yep. And there's, like a, there's a pin on this pawn, and this is bad. Yeah, two bishops too strong. Oh, that was in the notes. Okay, I could have just looked at it. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, but okay, he doesn't fall for it. He plays knight g3. Maybe it just feels like intuitively this is a more more solid move. Yeah, yeah, putting the knight on the defended square, of course. Defending g2. So queen h4, queen d3, rook f8, 
Q1, and E5. Oh, you're right, making things worse. Yeah, I think this is, um, this move is, is not helping, but, uh, B, because now D6 is very weak is the, is the problem. Um, but I have to play something. I just kind of have to cling to the position a little bit now, play like Rook F7 maybe. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a clear plan for freeing my kingside pieces here, but the weak D pawn is like an immediate sort of disaster in the game, so I don't think that I can consider E5. That's true, yeah, immediately just gives white um, a target. Now, to be fair, at this point, you're probably like way down on time, right? Yeah, it was. I had like six minutes to 30-something, something like that. Oh, I see. Yeah. It, I mean, it's just it's just very tough, obviously, to play with low time. So, um, you know, these moves are often, like, you, you should kind of go easy on them just because, like, okay, you had no time, so you have to do do something, right? Like, Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not like uh, some kind of real decision-making going on. Uh, Rick F7 makes sense because it's just, like, uh, it, it doesn't make things easy for white. Um, now at this point though, it'd be interesting. Did you feel like you know y your attack is is busted and you're worse, or did you f were you still feeling optimistic? No, I thought that I was in trouble. Now, like by the time that I played Rick, like after I had played Rick G five and Queen H four, it, it became clear to me that I was like in serious trouble. Okay, good. Yeah, because some players would still be like, you know, thinking they must they must have some chances here and like just trying to. Um, well, they burn all their time looking for some sack ideas that aren't working, and then, um, yeah, just end up losing both on the board and, and the clock. So e5, bishop, b6, rook f6, knight e4. Yeah, so, so now he's, like, winning by force. Oh, wow. Oh, okay, I guess, yeah, if position just opens up, then not too surprising. Um, oh, bishop d8, wow. Yeah, bishop d8. That was unex unex unexpected. Um, so did you have some follow-up in mind when you played e5? Or you just missed bishop d8? Because I guess he could have done it here. Or is this not... This um, if he does it immediately... Yeah, I think this is still good. I think it's still good. Um... Mm. So basically, I mean, you didn't have such a clear idea of what you wanted here. It's just like, okay, you thought rook f6, and then, you know, game continues, and that's Yeah, kind of... yeah, I had, I had missed bishop d8. Gotcha. Um, well, yeah, I mean, this game is like... Actually, I feel like it's a very common type of loss you'll see in tournament chess. It's like, you don't get caught in the opening, but it's just like you get a position where you're, you're not 100% sure what you're doing. So you spend time trying to figure it out. You don't really know where you stand. Like, are you worse? Are you totally fine? Are you slightly better at, all of a sudden? Um, and then, okay, that causes you to be like lower on time in the middle game. Maybe you misplay the attack because you're you haven't seen. I imagine you just haven't seen like a ton of examples of how to handle like this kind of position, right? With queen on h5 and like. Uh, Marazzi structure. Yeah, no, I I haven't, and in general, one of the weaknesses in sort of my my chess knowledge, chess studying, is that I I haven't played over very many games from like the database or game collections or or things like that. I I, I usually am am winging it in unfamiliar positions. Um, okay, nice. so let's let's just see how how did this game end? Did you have any any chances after this point? Um, I think I was I was pretty dead. Um, at some point he like, uh, his technique was a little bit questionable. He, he played some F4 move that, that we'll see later that mm -hmm. he didn't have to play opening up his king, but I, I think I was always objectively dead. Yeah. This, this queen H6 is really a sad thing to have to play here. Right. Yeah. It looks, it looks really bad. Okay. Threatening mates. Yeah. So I, I have to, yeah. And I basically have to distract his, his queen somehow to, mm-hmm to have any kind of like legal moves in this position yeah i mean i've definitely seen worse positions you know not get one so uh definitely we we play on here and just you know force the opponent to to find the the winning idea um yeah yeah so this see. this f4 was uh was fishy i i think that that he can just end it 
with uh, with this. And, and actually, he can just pre-move taking on g7 next because <laughs> his queenside pawns run. Nice. Yeah, let's let's show that. So here, just take b4, and the king doesn't uh, doesn't catch the pawns. Yeah, yeah. This is just it's just gg. Um, okay, I guess it's. Basically, okay, white just brings the king in. We'll take this pawn. Black king can never do anything against the connected passers, and yeah, it's just lost. Um, well, I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I think there might have been an even better um, uh, Oh, no, not here. There, there, was, there was some other line where they could play a5 here um, because their king could come to come to e2 but but not here because no, now they have like b4 or something oh right yeah yeah the pawns kind of promote at the same time um yeah actually that one is pretty simple i mean I, okay it shows kind of shows like yeah lack of technique because a lot of players you know they just want to win the game like cleanly like just not allowing any threats not having to calculate even if they're like very good tactical players we, psychologically we just want to feel like we're in total control where uh, yeah, this queen yeah. a queen f seven is like very simple to calculate for uh, like you know two thousand player. Uh, so instructive mistake. I mean, of course he was worried about bishop e five, but yeah, this was a much stronger way to to prevent that. Um, so okay, now you get some some activity. Yeah, but it's just it's just not enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, he 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 said after the game that he thought that um, that this was a try this queen c one move because I'm threatening. Queen f4. It's a little tricky to defend against it, but I uh, I think that I think that rook f7, defending the pawn and threatening queen a8, is just over. Mhm. Mm yeah. There's there's no king g8 um because of this guy and yeah yeah looks looks bad. Um. Well. Yeah. Your opponent played really well in this game. I mean, he. Okay. Maybe like he didn't play the best in uh, in the opening like early middle game, but. He found this ninety two move. Yeah, it was very strong. Um, yeah, and then all of his like ninety four bishop d eight. This was all well played, I think. Yeah, wow, talented kid. Um, cool. So, uh, so generally, yeah, I don't like to make like a ton of conclusions about like one game. I feel like if you see the same mistakes popping up in like a tournament, like five six games, then you can make a conclusion like oh, I need to stop doing this, or I need to work on this. Um, you know, this game could just be like, okay, you had this opening you weren't super familiar with, you went for this, like, okay, risky attack, but it didn't work out, and then your pieces were misplaced. So, like, that's kind of what happened, but it's not like, uh, I wouldn't say, like, oh, you got to stop attacking or something, like, <laughs> play more play more positional, but um, I, would, I would chalk this one up to yeah, just not being, like, comfortable with the, with the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so cool. I mean, do you, do you feel like this game was was useful? Yeah, um, because it was a it was a typical. Um, it was it was kind of a typical loss where, uh, uh, so, so, sort of things began to go downhill because I was unfamiliar with the uh, opening structure and uh, I sort of felt uncomfortable from the beginning. I, I got into time pressure as as a result. Um, and this, uh, this idea of like burning up a lot of time on Bishop takes G2 and then making a poor decision after throwing it out is a typical psychological mistake that I've, I've, I've definitely made in, in other games, but I feel like a follow up to this game, um, which I've, which I've done to, uh, some degree w when I was looking at the opening, writing up the notes is to simply play over, um, more games in. Uh, in this line and also in the Meroxy structure in general to get more of a more of a feel for how to play here Yeah, that would 100% be be really useful for you um, Okay, so it sounds like yeah, you do that um, Frequently this idea of kind of like overplaying the attack or spending too much time In this moment and then not being able to find something like to, to justify it um, I don't know if there's like a perfect fix for that other than just you know the usual like you draw awareness to the problem, and then, you know, during your training games, you just try to kind of remind yourself, like, okay, I need to not spend a lot of time, uh, unless I'm, like, 
really going to be going for something like very, very concrete. Yeah, and a, a lot of times the general problem that I have is that um, uh, it's not necessarily being drawn to uh, like an attacking move necessarily, but just really wanting to do something concrete when you just have to do something slow instead. Like bishop takes g2 is like the most concrete thing you can do in that position, and rook f7 is like um, uh, just getting a piece out of danger and waiting. Right. Um, so I, I, I often get into trouble... Uh, doing something concrete when I'm supposed to simply wait and be more patient. Gotcha. So, yeah, I mean, that that's definitely a balance that players have to uh, strike during the game. There's also a balance between, like, being um, greedy and materialistic versus um, trying to be objective and, uh, and concrete. Um, like, some, you know, some players are just afraid of taking pawns when their opponent um, sacrifices them, and as a result, they suffer because they didn't take the pawn, and then they just get crushed. Whereas yeah. it, it wasn't an objectively good pawn sacrifice and concretely you should take it. Vice versa, some players are often just very materialistic and grabbing material when, when they really shouldn't be. So it's kind of like a spectrum. It's like you don't want to just be making solid moves all the time because at a certain point you have to make a decisive decision and, and go for the attack. Or, you know, Like lifting a rook is often risky because the rook can be misplaced. Like you know, rook f5, rook g5. But um, right. a lot of times it's like a winning idea. So you, you have to be willing to do this one in certain cases. But of course you always have, also have to be willing to pull back. So I guess you're a little bit more on the decisive end. And so you just have to try to uh, counterbalance that uh, in your games. Just like hopefully there's like a little voice in the back of your head next time that's like, hold on. <laughs> Yeah. Like this isn't this isn't working, you know. Like and then, um, you know, you can always you can always pick a player and just ask like, what would they do in in this position? Uh huh. Um, yeah. Um, cool. Well, we'll be wrapping up the uh, the stream here, guys, uh, and we'll be continuing this one uh, basically every Monday around five p.m. Pacific time. If you missed the first uh, stream we did, we did this kind of like fun little assessment, and we we talked about Todd's uh, training plan a bit. Um, you can catch that video on uh, this channel under like the videos tab. These are also going to be going up on YouTube at some point. Um, probably edit it down. So if you want to see like the full version of everything, you should watch the replay. But otherwise, you're going to get a somewhat um, abridged version on on YouTube. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what we'll do next week. We'll maybe we'll do more um, game analysis. We'll definitely be like reviewing the training plan and um, yeah, probably just just play it by ear, see what um, kind of makes sense. But um, cool. yeah, Todd, thanks so much for, for coming on. I mean, it's been uh, hopefully like we get it. We get it rolling. Absolutely. It's been enjoyable. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care, guys. See you next time. Thanks, guys.